The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where we will discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in this 1977 movie. Joining me today on the panel are Thomas Salerno. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Dom. And Mike Denz. Hi, Mike. Great to be here. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to follow The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows in Apple Podcasts or in Google Podcasts. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn. We're on your favorite podcast app. We're also at the StarQuest or a YouTube channel where you should be sure to hit the bell to get notifications. And I want to tell you about another show on the network you're sure to enjoy, which goes right along with this one, The Secrets of Star Trek. That's right. If you enjoy The Close Encounters, you'll enjoy The Secrets of Star Trek. You can find that at sqpn.com slash trek or wherever fine podcasts are found. So we are talking about Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Jimmy. Uh, I kn- I'm sure that most people who are listening to this have probably uh, watched the movie, but could you give us a quick recap to get started? Sure. Uh, It's 1977, and strange things are starting to happen around the world. We begin by meeting a loose team of people that's coming together, including a French ufologist named Lacombe. Exactly who the group is isn't clear, as it also involves elements of the U.S. military and especially the Air Force. The first weird thing they investigate is the reappearance in the desert of a bunch of empty aircraft that famously vanished in 1945. But soon, they're investigating other weird things that are suggestive of UFO activity. The UFOs are also messing with the lives of ordinary people. One is a little boy named Barry. His mother, Jillian, desperately tries to save him, but he's apparently abducted by aliens. Another ordinary person the aliens mess with mess with is an electrician named Roy. As a result of his encounter, Roy is physically injured, loses his job, becomes obsessed with a particular geometric shape, and eventually goes crazy, losing his wife and children in the process. The mysterious UFO team discovers that the aliens want to meet at a geological formation known as Devil's Tower in Wyoming. So they set up a fake military nerve gas leak scare to evacuate the area. This attracts news coverage, and Roy and Jillian see Devil's Tower on the news and realize that's where the aliens are calling them based on the geometric shape they've been obsessing over. They go there, and they're captured by the military, but they eventually escape, and they're on hand to witness the meeting between the UFO team and the aliens. It's a very impressive meeting with a famous extended light and music show. The aliens reveal themselves and return bunches of people they've kidnapped over the years, including Jillian's son, Barry, who is reunited with his mother. The military also has a bunch of servicemen and women they're hoping to send on board the UFO mothership as part of an exchange program, and French ufologist Lacombe arranges for Roy to join the team. The aliens then pick Roy and let him leave with them and go to the stars. The end. Very good. So this is another Steven Spielberg movie. This is, uh, we talked recently about Jaws, his, uh, his first big blockbuster, and then we have... This one, right? Which I think is just his it second was, blockbuster. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was, he, he had wanted to do this ever since he was, uh, he had d- actually done an earlier version of it as a film student. But after Jaws, he had the clout in Hollywood needed to do a sci fi movie like this with a sizable budget at a time when that was not at all common. I wonder what the relationship is between this story and E.T., because that's another mm. one that he wanted to do a lot and also involves extraterrestrials, but much more friendly and familiar than this. So and that would follow on a few years later. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, like so it's and it also stars you mentioned Richard Dreyfus as Roy Neary, Melinda Dillon as Jillian, Terry Garr as Roy's wife. Uh, it's just a who's who of like uh, of seventies movies, Bob mm-hmm. Balaban, Carrie Duffy, and Francois Truffaut <clears throat> is Lacombe. 
Uh, yeah, this was uh, Francois Truffaut. So he's a famous uh, French film director mm -hmm. as well as actor. But this was the first American film he had uh, been in. Yes. And uh, mostly speaks French, although a few times with heavily accented English. Uh, but they give him a translator to, uh, for most of the movie. Spielberg didn't think he would accept and was quite excited and a little unnerved <laughs> at the idea <laughs> of directing him. Uh, but uh, he... He made it clear he had no intention of directing or helping direct. That He was just being paid to act, and that was it. That's awesome. Yeah. We should also mention his character, Claude Lacombe, is based on a real-world ufologist named Jacques Vallée. Uh, Jacques Vallée is kind of a younger contemporary of J. Allen Hynek. Uh, Jacques Vallée is French, um, and he's also a venture capitalist and computer expert, but in his off time, he does ufology, <laughs> and huh. uh, he's still around. He's 82 years old. I'm hoping to interview him for Mysterious World if I can make contact with him. Ooh, cool. Wow. You, Jimmy, you mentioned J. Allen Hynek. That's another name that people might be familiar with if they're if they've at all paid attention to UFO stuff over the years. Uh, but he was a he was an advisor on this movie, uh, mm -hmm. but he had some credentials, right? Yeah. So um, Steven Spielberg wanted Hynek to be a technical advisor on the movie because he wanted it to be, you know, within the constraints of fiction as as realistic as possible to the UFO source material. And uh, Hynek was an, was an expert. Uh, he was an astronomer who had been working for the U.S. government, uh, for the military, as a civilian consultant on a variety of different projects related to UFOs starting in 1947. Uh, people are probably most familiar with the UFO project known as Blue Book, which ended in 1969. Um, and Blue Book was active in the 50s and 60s. But earlier than that, there was this other series of them, including Project Sign, Project Grudge, Project Twinkle, and then eventually Project Blue Book. And he was there seemingly from the beginning, starting to act as a consultant in 1947. He initially was essentially a debunker. He um, he knew that that's what the military wanted him to do, was to debunk UFO sightings and explain them naturally. Um, and he's most famous, even though he he actually put a lot of qualifications on this, but he's he became infamous for explaining one UFO encounter as swamp gas that had just like St. Elmo's fire. And, and that phrase swamp gas took off and was widely mocked. Mm. But eventually, um, Hynek, uh, after looking at, after, you know, going through all these accounts and interviewing witnesses and seeking natural explanations, he came to believe that, no, there is something really weird going on here. And the extraterrestrial hypothesis should be taken seriously. And so he he had a conversion from the debunker camp to the tentative believer camp. And he later founded his own UFO, UFO organization called KUFOS, the Center for UFO Studies. And he actually has a, uh, a bit part in the film. He, it's just a walk on. But in the big climactic rock concert at the end, uh, <laughs> you see him walking up, smoking a pipe. And that's J. Allen Hynek. So in 2019, the History Channel had a very short lived, highly fictionized TV show called Blue Book, Project Blue yes. Book, that was entertaining, totally fiction. Uh, but, uh, but they based every episode on some real case. Uh, and there is actually a scene at one point of him on the set of Close Encounters, uh, you know, it, within oh. it. So it kind of goes in circles there. So, yeah. 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 And if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Jimmy, what was Hynek not the, the researcher who coined the phrase Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Correct. Yes. He, uh, he, uh, developed the close encounters scheme. Um, and there's, it actually, his encounter scheme has like six parts. There are three kinds of distant encounters. And then there are three kinds of close encounters where you get to see the UFO at a, at a close enough distance. It's not just a light in the sky. So you can, you can see detail. And, and this was typically estimated as like 500 feet or something like that. And so 
and they don't actually explain in the film, I don't think, what the no. three nope. encounters are. But basically, uh, close encounters the first time are just seeing a UFO in the distance. Close encounters of the second time are where you have some kind of physical evidence of, of its presence, where it's interacted with its environment, like, you know, leaving impressions on the ground from where it landed. Or I think radar returns are put uh, under this category as well, if I recall correctly. And then close encounters of the third kind are where you get to see occupants. So people get out of the UFO or you see them through windows in the UFO, uh, but you see more than just the craft itself. Now, the problem for me when I was six years old, when this came out and the years following is I thought this was a series. I'm like, well, <laughs> what about Close Encounters? Did I miss Close Encounters of the First Kind? Do I need to watch the first two before I can watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Uh, so it took me a while to figure out there was only one movie. Uh-huh. A little bit more about the about the the time when this came out, this was 1977, the same year that Star Wars came out. So, you know, science fiction was big. Uh, and in fact, both movies nominated for a bunch of Academy Awards, but neither one of them won Best Director. Uh, George Lucas and Spielberg were nominated, but uh, what was, uh, see, I got to hear, Woody Allen won for Annie Hall. And mm. uh, they, neither one won Best Picture either, even though they were both nominated. Uh, let's see, I was trying to, find the list of academy awards um i'm still curious about music because was was williams nominated for both he was nominated for both and oh, i had the the list of the 50th it was the 50th academy awards and i'm just pulling it up here um uh it was also uh the it, as far as grossing at the theaters star wars beat beat everybody by a, a large yeah. margin smoking the bandit was number two close encounters of the third time third kind number three and uh, we should do uh, Smoking the Bandit as an episode someday. That's just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, Michael, you mentioned seeing this uh, film in the theaters. I also saw it in the theaters and I remember it. Uh, I, I remember, you know, many of the iconic images like the mashed potato scene and the giant Devil's Tower filling Roy's house. Um, yes. and other things. But what I particularly remember, I was seeing it with a friend who had already seen it. So he, he had watched it all the way through before and he went to see it again with me and we're sitting there and we get to about, um, we get close to the end of the film and they've had this encounter with the aliens at, at Devil's Tower and there's a fake out. Where it's like, okay, the UFO ships fly off and everyone's congratulating each other and getting ready to go home. And I'm getting ready to go home, too, <laughs> because I think the movie's over now. And my friend says, no, we've got another 20 minutes. And I'm going, what? Really? <laughs> they just told us a complete story. And, and indeed, in the uh, director's cut that I watched for this... It's actually another 29 minutes. Right. <laughs> and oh, so wow. it's like the ending hadn't even begun yet. Is that the only extra, the, the ending that he put in the director's cut? There are three versions of the movie. There's the original theatrical. Then there's mm -hmm. the director's cut, which, uh, which adds the scene inside the mothership. Which actually, the, that's the special edition. Uh, sorry, that's the special edition that adds. Yeah. And then there's a collector's edition. So a special edition came out in 1980 where they wanted to re-release it in theaters a few years later. And Columbia put him up to it and he made him put the mothership scene in, which he didn't want to do. Yeah, they wanted that because they wanted to advertise new footage. You're going to get to see more, you know, exciting stuff. But he didn't like that. And so when in the 1990s, he came out with the director's cut or the collector's edition, as it's sometimes called, he took that back out. Yeah. So the collector's edition is 137 minutes, which is two minutes longer than the original and five minutes more than the special edition. So the the special edition was actually shorter, the shortest of them, which is funny, mm -hmm. even though they added that scene because he took other stuff out. He tightened up some of the, the other scenes and, and that sort of thing. So the collector's edition from 1998 is the longest version. We'll have a link to where you can see on YouTube the the added scene of Inside the Mothership. But Spielberg thought that that revealed too much. Like it it kind of spoiled the the mm -hmm. the ending a bit by giving you more. It takes away from the mystery, but it is it is fascinating to see. It's really impressive. I mean, mm. you know, the exterior visuals were impressive enough, but when you see the inside of the ship 
it is like, wow, okay, I would be overwhelmed if I was if I was Roy. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> now this was before CGI, so that mothership yeah. must have been a model shot. Yes. Yeah, it's all practical effects. Yep. Wow. It's, I think it's ILM who did the interior mothership, but it, I, I could be wrong. But I, I, but Doug Trumbull did all of the. He was a he's a famous name in movie special effects from that era, and he he did the the ones on this. Uh, and to close the loop on earlier, John Williams was nominated for both Star Wars and this, but one for Star Wars. So, uh, yeah. He went against himself. <laughs> I think the model, if I remember reading it, for the exterior of the big mothership was about nine feet uh, wow. wide. So that's pretty. That's pretty surprising. Big. Yeah, they yeah. they built big models back then. Like the Death Star in Star Wars was really big. So the there's a lot of thought about imagery, religious imagery in this. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know how much we you know it 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 might be a bit of a stretch. Like some people say, you know, Mount, the devil's tower compares to Mount Sinai and Neri is a Moses figure. And there's, mm. there might be something to it because that it, in the scene in Neri's home, that first scene in the house with the kids, they're watching TV. They actually have the 10 commandments on. Yeah. You know, Cecil B. DeMille's 10 commandments. So maybe, maybe Spielberg intended to have that imagery or that connection. I don't know, but I just thought it was interesting. I actually noticed something from the very beginning of the movie that might have tied into something at the very end in terms of like themes and stuff. His wife calls him Jiminy Cricket early okay. in the movie. Yes. And I thought that at the end, you did. I heard some of the notes of when you wish upon a star. You yes, definitely I heard, heard that. that too. Yeah, that is yeah. at the end. So, and, yeah. That's, and there that's was that little uh, wind up toy or model inside his home that played yes. it too, at least once. Right. Well, oh, and then they wanted to go see Pinocchio. You know that. So there's a. Uh, he's trying to get them to go see Pinocchio uh, to the movies. So there was that. Hmm. So I want to kind of like bring up some of the details too, because the the planes that are found in the desert at the very beginning, that's Flight 19, right, Jimmy? Yes. Uh, flight 19 is um, famous as one of the uh, one of the flights that vanished in the so-called Bermuda Triangle, which we will be having an episode of Mysterious World on. <laughs> awesome. um, they even though they're from 1945, they're not from World War II because they they took off in December of 1945. So the war was already over at that point, but they were leaving Florida on a training exercise and they r later radioed in and said, we're lost. We don't, we don't know where we are. And there they, they disappeared. The conventional explanation is, well, they got lost and they crashed. Um, and that is borne out by the official military transcript, but there is reportedly, or I should say there was reportedly a, uh, a a ham radio operator or something, some kind of you know private person with a radio rig, who overheard an additional bit of the conversation uh, with one of the pilots saying they look like they're not from this world, and mm -hmm. and so so you know you can take that for <clears throat> for what it is. It's a little suspicious. Number one, you know the military didn't have that in their transcripts. And this was not in an era where they were censoring this stuff. In fact, two years later in 47, they're launching investigations into this. Um, also, how would, um, I mean, it's possible, but how would a pilot in December 1945 know what something would look like if it's not from this world? This is before the UFO craze started in 1947. So there wasn't there weren't stereotypical UFOs yet. Mm -hmm. And if you just saw a big light or a big disc or something in the sky, you wouldn't automatically think extraterrestrial because when the UFO craze started, people did not automatically think extraterrestrial. Like we talked about in the original Kenneth Arnold sighting, when Kenneth Arnold saw the first saucers in mid 47, he thought and he they weren't quite saucers, but he thought they were some secret government project. And so that's what a lot of people would have suspected. Mm. And uh, I love the fact that the planes are like brand new. They still get all their fuel in them. It's like they've skipped 30 years, which is what it was 30 years from, you know, 47 to 77. So uh, they that's started up. One of them started up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all the guys come running toward the propeller. I'm like, stop. <laughs> yeah. I know you haven't seen the, any Raiders of the Lost Ark yet, but stop. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
One thing, so this scene is one of a number, this is right at the beginning of the movie, and it's one of a number of things that that really kind of reminded me in watching this. I mean, I think this is the first time I've seen this movie since certainly the 80s, maybe mm-hmm. the first time since the 70s. Um, but in watching it today, this so much reminds me of the X-Files. Yeah. Um, this is This is like a big, this is like an X-Files movie. And it has that same kind of cinematic sweep that the X-Files would in taking us to the desert and to foreign locations and things like that. It has this kind of global feel like, like, like the original X-Files movie and like some of the uh, two-parters in the X-Files. You also have the same kind of themes of you've got this government investigation going on and there's secretive stuff going on. And then you have Jillian and Roy as kind of our Mulder and Scully in a way. There are, there are two individual protagonists who are trying to find their way to the truth against resistance and secretive organizations and so forth. But it really felt a lot. I can only imagine Chris Carter was directly inspired by this and probably watched it a bunch of times. There's even one moment where they're having their, one of the UFO campouts and where people are gathering to, Mm -hmm. to on a roadside to watch for UFOs. And we've already seen one of these where people are waiting and the UFOs come whipping down the highway, including the little glowing red ball that follows at the end. <laughs> yes. I love that little red ball. Yeah, that was um, great. But the second time this happens, they're, they're seeing lights coming in the distance and they're assuming it's UFOs and it's a fake out. It's actually helicopters and suddenly it's terrifying. Right. And the X-Files did exactly that. Yes. You know, where you'd have, oh, it's a UFO. And then, no, it's a sinister government helicopter. You know, I, I, that just happened. I was watching uh, Stranger Things just last night, the latest season, and they did the exact same thing in like the third episode where, you know, the, the house starts shaking and this glowing blue light descends from above and it's it's aliens no it's a government helicopter landing on the lawn <laughs> no it's it's funny you mentioned stranger things because you're watching that and of course it's a period piece so you're reminiscing about all the 80s mm-hmm. uh, outfits hairstyles they're using tape decks all this and then i go and watch uh literally hours later uh close encounters and i'm like oh yeah another period oh wait no this was 77 <laughs> they are using that's yes. the tech they had at the time which i really appreciate Yep, and 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 it, then I reminded me of Independence Day, uh, and especially with uh, well, let's go to the regular people, let's go to the military, go to the government, uh, you know, yeah. all these different things, all the way to the homage of the helicopter, uh, which is Welcome Wagon, doing oh, the lights yeah. to communicate, right? And kind of as funny as an exploding helicopter can be, I guess, like they're all like. They're, they're opening up. Wait, no, hold on. They're, they're, they're trying to communicate and they just blast them out of the sky. I'm like, okay, this isn't close encounters. This is a whole different animal. But yeah. so many things in, inspired by what Spielberg does for the really the first time in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very, this is an unprecedented science fiction movie. There really isn't anything like this before. I mean, you've had other science fiction movies and other science fiction movies involving UFOs. But it's never been it's never been given this kind of treatment before. By the way, one other X Files connection. Um, here we have the little boy Barry abducted, mm-hmm. and he's Jillian's son. Well, in the X Files, Fox Mulder's sister Samantha is abducted, right. and the vi- the visuals of Barry's abduction look a lot like the visuals of Samantha's abduction when we see it on TV. And it's just another thing that, okay, Chris, uh, Chris Carter has just kind of rearranged it so that it, so that it's, 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 it's the man's sister instead of the woman's son who gets abducted. You know, even down to things like, you know, that scene where the, the, the army is rolling out to go to devil's tower and they're, you know, they're disguising the army trucks with Piggly Wiggly and, you know, Baskin Robbins (laughs) signs. And it's this high energy, you know, we're loading up, we're going and it's very brisk. And that's, again, something that's very characteristic of this movie and X-Files, you know, it's Mm -hmm. that sort of, that sort of energy. And and I I don't think it's the first time it shows, is that it shows up in this movie, but it's very characteristic of a lot of things Spielberg does. You'll see this in Jurassic Park 20 years later. Mm 
What, what I loved about that scene is the fact that all those vehicles they were using to cover their military convoy were marked with, you know, so mm -hmm. so, so they have Baskin Robbins and Piggly Wiggly and stuff on them. Um, so they look like ordinary trucks instead of being sinister, unmarked vehicles, because <laughs> That was the big thing back in the 90s, all the black helicopters and the unmarked vans and right. things like this. It's like, no, if you're really a sinister government organization and you're on your game, you're going to slap product placement <laughs> all over your secret transport. <laughs> How do you think they get uh, nuclear warheads across this country? They don't do it on trucks marked nuclear bombs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, another interesting thing that's characteristic of this movie and some others and lends a real air of authenticity to it, I think anyway, is... It it comes up in the in a early scene of the uh, air traffic control center in Indianapolis. Oh, that scene was fantastic. You have airliners that are on a collision course with the UFO, and there's this cacophony of dialogue among the air traffic controllers, and it's it, it's really becomes apparent. It's less important that we hear exactly what they're saying than that there's an emergency. It's about conveying the atmosphere of the event as opposed to clear dialogue from each actor in the scene. And I thought that it's fascinating because he, do, he does it again several times in this movie and he does it in other movies of this era where that he's, that he does like he did it in Jaws and he'll do it again later. That's a technique that was popularized by Orson Welles in Citizen Kane, which introduced overlapping dialogue or which helped popularize overlapping dialogue as a filmmaking technique. Because mm. previously the argument is we need to hear what everybody is saying. But Wells's argument was that's not real life. It's not verisimilitude. People talk over each other. Right, right. They were also real um, air traffic controllers that he got to do it. I and wondered about that. Yeah, yeah. they were. They were very. Uh, yeah, they they were either really good actors or, or real air traffic control. <laughs> I liked it because it reminded me of Jaws in the sense that we're not seeing the danger. We're just we just know something really horrible is happening. So you could have had a shots of airplanes getting really close together or right. uh, you know, being disrupted by a ufo that nobody wants to report but it was much more mysterious and frightening to just watch the faces of these men saying what's going on what's happening do you want to report this no <laughs> nope, i don't even I don't know how to report it <laughs> i <Yeah>. see nothing <laughs> i don't want to lose my career uh that was yeah that was that is great that's a good point because it is it it would have been easier in some senses, although more expensive in special effects, to show the the thing on the screen with the plane and the thing flying past them, but to have it all from a distance, which is because this is, I think, Jimmy, if you we can maybe concur, mm -hmm. this is how most people kind of experience UFO phenomena is reports from other people where I don't have a firsthand knowledge of it. You know, what I mean, I'm hearing someone else talking about it, but I'm not seeing it firsthand. Yeah, most, I mean, a lot of people see unidentified things, but most people don't, haven't reported it. They've only heard about it. In this case, what makes it dramatic is is precisely the fact that you've got these experts who are listening to a tense situation evolving in real time, and they don't know what's going on. Mm. Uh, another effective technique that Spielberg does is, again, uh, hiding the shark until late in the movie, so to speak, mm -hmm. is when that first scene with Barry and Jillian, the little boy, and his toys wake up in the night, which is wicked creepy. And oh. uh, there's even a little tank. M my wife, Melanie, tells a story about her brothers had a little tank that w was alive. It, they even took the batteries out and it would come alive in the night and drive around. Very creepy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a whole nother uh, hey, episode of Mysterious Polter, World. You might want to get them on Mysterious World. <laughs> Poltergeist activity. Yeah. yeah. So, Recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, we should talk about that. So anyway, uh, but when he goes downstairs and goes to the kitchen and there's all this stuff going on and you see his face uh, and you, but you don't see the things that he's seeing. Like he's right. obviously seeing the cr creatures doing things. And he has a kind of pleased, friendly look on his face. Yes. Um, one of the, so this kid is, I, I, I don't know how old this kid is, but he's really young. Three or four. I think it, he was. Yeah. yeah, and normally acting with ch child actors that young are just death on screen. Yeah, I looked at it. Uh, he was born in 72 and thinking that they did a lot of the filming in 76, so four. Okay. Yeah. I, I was reading that, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Stanley Kubrick yes. was so impressed 
by this kid's acting that he he tried to get him for the shining um oh. but uh but it it didn't work out for scheduling reasons wow. yeah they called him one take barry uh, he was i think his name is barry uh, yeah because he was so good uh maybe one or two takes and uh some of the things that spielberg would do like he had um to get him frightened a little bit or just kind of look of awe there was a, i think a gorilla and a clown that popped out <laughs> and and he's like whoa and then one of them took their mask off and smiles at him which elicited a smile in the boy um and the to- when he said toys he was literally holding toys up uh-huh, for the right. kid to see so he really i mean spielberg was demonstrating uh you know his obvious future with children actors like an et and stuff that yep. he was good at that yeah i i love his barry's line later when everything's going crazy in the house and the uh the vacuum cleaner starts moving around and he just goes clean everything up you know in his little <laughs> yeah. kid voice and i'm like that's great that's yeah. so charming he, he even has a little bit of the look of the of the gray alien gray you know the big gray aliens <laughs> at the end i mean he's got the big eyes and the kind of the big head so yeah it's it it, it kind of fits uh carrie guffey is is, is the actor's name and he's be, he okay, went on to be, carrie not barry yeah close. but he went on to become a uh, financial planner and uh uh, he credits this movie to the the movies in general that he, he did for a few years to uh, his uh, training him in how, the importance of financial ma- management or something <laughs> yeah, like I that. Got, I got money. What do I do? Exactly. <laughs> um, so so then we have so that's Jillian and Barry and we have Roy and his family. And it's very interesting dynamic in this family. Uh, the, the you've got the, the the son who's I think he said he's eight. He says, uh. How old are you? Eight. If you want to see nine, you're going to go see Pinocchio tomorrow night. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> so um, and uh, they uh, what was it? They, they, you know, they're just they're doing model trains and it's very frantic and the house is kind of in an uproar all the time. And it's like, yes, that's my house. <laughs> I have <laughs> sons. Yeah, that would be my house. Um, One thing I was kind of carefully watching in this is Terry Gar's role because yeah. she's she's Roy's wife. Roy is played by Richard Dreyfus. And so she's Roy's wife and she ultimately leaves him and I was con- I was interested to see how are they going to portray her because it would be very easy for a lesser filmmaker to portray her as unsympathetic, you know, mm-hmm. in order to justify why she leaves him to the audience because uh, ultimately Spielberg needs our sympathies to be with Roy. But he and a lesser filmmaker, in order to make our sympathies be with Roy, would give him a harpy for a wife. And she is not that. She is very reasonable. I mean, she's not perfect, but she is very reasonable. She she is in love with Roy early on, like when he takes her to the first UFO camp out. It's his second, but her first. Yep. She's she's like reliving romantic memories with him and gives him a kiss and everything. And anti. Yeah, dealing with this very well, I think she says. <laughs> yeah, and eventually, um, eventually, he just goes completely crazy. Yeah, and and this is I have in my notes. I have um, so like it, at various points, but I'll I say alien behavior. This uh, this incomprehensible is dangerous because they just do so much in this movie that makes no sense from a human mm-hmm. perspective. And if you, if you can't have a, uh, if you, if, if you just can't understand half of what another species is doing, that makes them dangerous. And then I have um, aliens kidnap children, induce mental illness and cause family trauma. Um, I then have, uh, and by the end after, uh, or quite a bit before the end, actually, um, Roy is, is just so obsessed. He's, he's finally figured out the shape he's obsessing over needs to be a kind of, of, of cylinder, like an ice cream cone with its top ripped off because that's what devil's tower looks like. Only he doesn't know that yet. Mm-hmm. And he's just going around his yard throwing plants, ripping them out of the ground and throwing them in through the kitchen window, not even bringing them in through the door. He's yep. shoving stuff in through the kitchen window. Uh, he shoves in a garbage can. He steals the neighbor's uh, chicken fencing. He shoves that in. He's got all this Sorry, dirt bricks. going in, bricks. <laughs> yeah. He's he's genuinely crazy at he this point. He like himself through it instead of going yeah. through the door. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. He's not just misunderstood. 
at this point, because that would be, you know, kind of what you would expect. He's our misunderstood hero. But no, he is our crazy hero. Right. And and Terry Gar's character is absolutely right to get the kids out of there. Yeah. Um, now we could you, do a test uh, and pick 10 random married men and have them <laughs> throw dirt in the kitchen window. Yeah with plants and just see how, how your wife does. I think that was, there's no question. There's no way you can't have sympathy with her. And it's interesting too, Jimmy, cause she was not known. We, we, we watch it now when we think Terry Gar and all the movies she's been in and she's funny and uh, very adorable. But then she Spielberg saw her in a commercial and liked how she had a range of emotions in a commercial. And that's why I hired her. So she wasn't somebody who you already had kind of preconceived sympathies with. She was just, you know, his wife. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. She'd done some stuff, but that was her first big nothing, thing. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing big. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking through and it's, it's a lot of B movies and, and bit roles. One of the, one of the things just to tie, just to tie up a loose end, I, upon watching this movie and realizing how incomprehensible the aliens behavior is, because like you mentioned the turning on the toys and, and all the chaos they're causing with random things happening. Um, these aliens are not good. Mm -hmm. This is not E.T. Um, the These aliens are incomprehensible, unpredictable, and causing huge amounts of damage to people in their lives. I know we're meant to have this optimistic ending. And okay, I guess it's better than, than, the, than them wanting to eat us. <laughs> but frankly, we need to not have much to do with these people until we're on a competitive technological footing because they are crazy yep. by human standards. They are crazy and dangerous. And they send people off with them. They're like, oh, we'll have this nice cultural exchange program. It'll be great. <laughs> and so I'm like, uh, maybe. <laughs> it seems like they don't, they don't quite understand. Like, well, this is how we do it. You know, like we, we, put things in your mind to trigger you this is this is just the way we communicate kind mm. of like how you know we might interact with animals or or something and think that you know we're really not disturbing we're just you know darting you and putting a tag on your ear and sending <laughs> you back off you know that didn't really interrupt your day it's not a big deal but you know and so they're doing these things and i was interpreting it as they just don't realize how strange and bizarre and and nonsensical this kind of interaction is and that this this just you just don't do this you don't just take people away for 30 years they're truly alien i mean that's the the idea yeah. is they're not just right. human beings with bumps on their foreheads like in star trek you know they're truly alien in their behavior and the way they interact with the with the world around them yeah and there's an aspect to which that argument works um at the same time you know, they're driven by a process of evolution, just like things here on Earth are. And we managed to find a way to, I mean, the behavior of Earth animals is more comprehensible than what's going on with these guys. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. sure. Um, I, I can better relate to an octopus or a bear or, you know, a scorpion than I can to these guys. These guys are just insane. I can under, you know, I can understand the behavior of terrestrial animals. And sure, if we met aliens, it would be a little different, but they're shaped by evolution as well. They're, you know, they're going to have the same basic drives and the same basic uh, set of behaviors through convergent evolution. Um, but these, these people are just insane. Uh, yeah. By Especially the way, speaking, if they're bipedal and, you know, two yeah. eyes and that oh, sort yeah. of thing. I was wondering, is this movie the origin of, like, our cultural idea of the gray, bulgy-headed, bulgy-eyed alien? Or was that in the UFO literature previously? That entered the UFO literature in the 1960s. Um, most famously, um, and it's it may have been inspired by an episode of The Outer Limits, at least that's the skeptical explanation. But where that r started to take off was after the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. Um, they reported being being abducted by short people with big heads. They weren't, depending on the account you listen to, because their accounts changed over time, th but they weren't exactly the modern greys. Um, but that's what developed in pop culture and certainly um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind popularized that image. 
And there was a little bit of ET uh, that you could see. I mean, yeah. you, you could see how ET came from them. I think the original uh, puppet alien that came out had an extended neck. And they all might have, but I know he did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's sort of a giant, a larger version, and then there are the smaller ones who are played by child actors. The giant one is a puppet, and wow, right. is it not a very good puppet? No. It's, it, yeah. It, it and you never really see it again. Yeah. yeah. For good reason. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the children were all girls because Spielberg thought they were more graceful in the way they would move around and stuff. But you can tell. I thought you could tell they were they were children just kind of bumping into each other in these suits. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as they as they filmed them. Yeah. the The giant alien puppet has like the worst legs and arms. Um, they're almost. They're not like. They're kind of like pipe cleaners without the fuzz. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they just kind of bend in the middle for elbows and knees, but they're, it, it, they, they attach to the body and the, it, it just looks terrible. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the worst effect in the movie. Um, it also didn't make sense that it was so big uh, for what obviously was designed for the little aliens, but this thing had to crouch down and, and climb out like he didn't really fit the, the spaceship yeah. yeah this this is actually something that does appear in the ufo literature though um oh, really? in, a, in a lot of the abduction literature um there's a kind of taxonomy of aliens that are reported and the grays the little short guys they're the most popular or they're the most commonly reported but then there are several other kinds of aliens and one of them are the tall grays who are like the greys, but they're either human sized or even slightly bigger. And so that's actually something that does correspond to some of the UFO literature. One thing, Michael, that you brought up was, um, you know, how the aliens have been communicating with, with humans. And you pointed out something that I had meant to mention, which is that like Roy and Jillian, the reason they're obsessed with the shape of Devil's Tower and the reason they feel compelled to go there is because they have been mentally implanted. That's the term they use in the film, implanted with a vision of all this. And so this is they even have knowledge of the layout when they get there. They have it's they've never been here before, but they know where to hide. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that based on their vision because he sculpted so, it <laughs> yeah he had three-dimensional knowledge because he sculpted it and not only an Im a, a vision but a, a sense of this is important he couldn't right. just let it go as something he had seen but that this had an importance that compelled him to need to find right. out what it was and so this is telepathic manipulation um, right. These aliens are altering. It's, it's not just that Roy becomes obsessed. They drive him crazy with telepathic manipulation. And that raises other questions. Like if they can communicate telepathically, why do we need the music and the hand signals? Right. You know, why didn't they just learn English from all the pilots they abducted? <laughs> um they obviously learned something because the way they tell the UFO group to meet them at Devil's Tower is by sending sending latitude and longitude coordinates. <laughs> that made so me they, laugh. <laughs> yeah. so they not only know our number system, they they know how they have maps of Earth specific enough using our coordinate system to tell us where to go. Except they really didn't. One of the things I remember reading in, back in the 70s, I would read UFO magazines when I could find them on the newsstand. And I remember reading an article in a UFO magazine about this where they pointed out, and I verified this upon rewatching the movie, the coordinates they give in the movie are not those of Devil's Tower. They are nearby, but they are not Devil's Tower. Uh. And, and in the UFO magazine, they... They headcanoned, as we would say today, what must have happened. The UFO, the aliens went to the correct location, found that we weren't there, <laughs> and then came to Devil's Tower. <laughs> what's, what's that bright light over there? Let's go check what's going on over there. <laughs> Those silly humans couldn't find their own place. Uh, so the, speaking of the tones, that's, that is a big part of the, of the movie. In fact, it's one of the enduring ideas from the movie is this this tone that they came up with uh let me play it for you these five tones that they use to communicate uh and in fact they they first get the the, the music when they go to india 
and the people are singing the this this tone, which is a beautiful actually thousands of people singing this beautiful uh, tone. Uh, and they go, where did these sounds come from? And I love the way that Spielberg frames a shot, like this guy standing on the hill yelling out to the crowd, and you don't see the crowd; they're out of frame, below frame. Where do these sounds come from? And then all these hands shoot up, straight up, pointing to the sky. Just a great, great framing shot. Yeah. I remember back in the 70s, I would, every and lots of other kids would hum those tones all the time. And they also introduce hand signs that yep. correspond to them. And these, the hand signs they use were developed, and they mentioned his name in the film, but by a guy named Zoltan Kodaly. And, um, and they're, and, and they look cool, I guess, but I remember constantly mimicking the hand signs as a kid <laughs> from the film. Um, and, and I didn't know at the time and you couldn't easily look it up, but those things are real. They're a system of what's known as solfege or sometimes solfeggio, you'll hear it said. Um, and, uh, this kind of technique was originally developed uh, of matching hand signs to musical tones was originally used in the Middle Ages to help monks know what tone to sing next. So you'd have like the choir director of the monk doing the hand signs mm -hmm. because, you know, it, you didn't have as many manuscripts and stuff because they all had to be handmade. Um, and these days it's sometimes used for training in, in music. Like if you can, if I make this sign, you sing this note and it's a way of, of learning learning the scales and just go straight to that note. Don't sing anything else. Right. Right. So there's a scene where the government is trying to dispel the rumors and, and debunk everything. And they, they have uh, like uh, air force officials in this big conference room with a bunch of the people who were at the, you know, the, the uh, UFO camp out and they've got all the, the news crews are there. And uh, the, the one Civilian official says, you know, America, Americans took seven billion photos last year and no one of them caught indisputable evidence of UFOs. And I love the fact that this this old newsman says, I've been in the news business for a long time and we've never photographed a plane crash as it happened or an automobile crash for the six o'clock news. So that doesn't mean anything. And I'm sitting there going, wow, how have times changed? Yeah. Now people take tens of billions of photos a year and we do have photos and video of plane crashes and automobile crashes and all that sort of thing. So it's kind of fascinating on the one hand, that was a dumb point that that civilian official tried to make, but nevertheless, yeah, it, was a, it was a great comeback by the newspaper was, man. Yes. And yet it would, it would be truer today because everybody's got a camera now in their pocket all the time. Well, and and we have surveillance cameras all over the place and security cameras all over the place. So yeah, that's how we've gotten video of plane crashes, I mean most of them. And yep. although also if you know like if you're at an air show, people are using their phones and there can be an accident. Right. But but back then that would have been absolutely true. Yes, yeah. I just think it was fascinating to see the differences. Like uh, even like the technology you mentioned before, Mike, the, you know, Roy's lost on these back roads in the, in the blackout, you know, as he's like, he's like a lineman for the utility company or something. And he's lost and he's got a map that he's trying to follow. And he's, you know, he doesn't have a phone on him. Of course, he, you know, there's no cell phones and no GPS. And it's kind of, it kind of plays into how the movie develops. And even later on when he's driving to devil's tower and he's, He's driving down the country road with a map in front of his face and nearly causes a massive accident as he's driving into Everyone's traffic. leaving. Everyone's leaving. He's the only one going the other way. Right. And there, he even had uh, a cool, like, map that he pulled down from his visor, like a, yeah. a roll-up map and everything. Yeah. I'm like, well, that's pretty dangerous to have a map <laughs> you could just pull in front of your face and, and block things with. But, I mean, that certainly dated, uh, you know, the movie uh, pretty pretty well with, with all the maps and everything. Yes. and um, yeah, that reminds you of the, you know, we're backtracking a little bit, but he, it was interesting. I don't know what you thought of the first time he experienced, yes. uh, I guess it would be a first encounter. Uh, all the things were shaking. The sign was shaking. The mailboxes were shaking. And then he notices that when the helicopters came, it was shaking the sign the same way. Yeah. And it was kind of like, right. that was a clue to, you know, these, these things are similar in some way. 
Yeah, I took that as now he's having reason to doubt when he sees the wind from the helicopter shaking another street sign. It's like, okay, what did I see before? Could it have a natural explanation? Yeah, yeah, that's right. where I went with yeah. it too, uh, you know, and, and and initially, and then I'm thinking, or was it the other way around? But when I first saw it, he was kind of like, oh, okay, we thought those were UFOs coming at us. Mm -hmm. And then we saw their helicopters, but they do the same thing. In, I really love the scene where he's in his truck, where he yeah. has his first encounter. And one of the things I love about it is um, it, you ha he has this, Spielberg has this sort of reverse double fake out. Yes, or, I love yeah. it. Where, where he's, Roy is sitting in his truck. He's trying to find the place he's supposed to go because the UFOs have caused a power blackout. And so he's been called out to try to fix the electrical system not knowing it's a UFO that has caused the blackout. And so he's sitting on the road, in the middle of the road, uh, trying to find his, where he's supposed to go on a map. And you see these lights appear in his rear view window, in his rear window. And you're thinking, oh, those are aliens. <laughs> and and he just he just waves, he, he interprets them as a car and gestures with his hand to wave them to go around the vehicle, which they then do and cuss at him for stopping in the middle of the road. <laughs> well, then he continues looking at his map and more lights appear in his rear window. And this time the lights sit there for a second and he does the same thing. He tries to gesture them to go around <laughs> and instead of going around, they start to lift up up and <laughs> just start awesome. floating up into the sky it was that was wonderful that was great i loved that one that was a, that was great it was i remember i literally remember the first time seeing that and being so freaked out like holy smokes <laughs> that's the ufo and, yeah, I, and they designed the ufo to it could be a car it, yeah. it lights like a car yeah and then later on because then everything you know everything blacked out in his truck and uh sucking you know the electricity out and all these things are happening and then when his flashlight comes back on, it scares the crap out of him. And <laughs> yeah, right. And and I wanted to point out that is that is actual uh, ufological lore. UFOs are reported to interfere with electrical systems, including causing vehicles to suddenly stop and then mysteriously restart after the UFO is gone. So mm. that's part of UFO lore. Another thing that they make a big deal out of, or it's not a big deal, but early on they make a point out of, uh, Roy is physically injured by his encounter with this mm -hmm. because he gets this horrible sunburn over the half of his face and neck that were exposed to the the window of his truck. And, um, and other people have been sunburned by the UFOs they've encountered too. That is also part of UFO lore. Um, in particular, and this was actually not for another three years, but there's a famous event that occurred in 1980 called the Cash Landrum event. And it occurred in, in Texas down near Houston. We will be talking about it on Mysterious World. But basically, you had these uh, two women and one of their grandsons. It's Christmas. They're going out for bingo, which I guess you do at Christmas some, in some families. <laughs> sure. But they're, they're going out for bingo. And we all they, have our tradition. Yeah. And they... And they <laughs> They stop on the road when they see this mysterious light of a craft seemingly landing in front of them in the road. And it's struggling. It's putting out like a lot of bluish light. Um, it looks like it's struggling to stay airborne. They get out of the car and... Um, and actually, one of the women, these were religious women, one of the women thinks it's the second coming. And is like getting out of the car to greet Jesus. She burns her hand on the car handle. Um, and the little boy, fortunately, stays inside the car. Um, but they then see all these helicopters go flying over and kind of chase off the craft that they that was landing in front of them. And these people got radiation illness. Ooh. especially the ones who got out of the car. They got it bad. Uh, it caused, it, they clearly encountered something that was real. Now, it may have been classified government project, but it was something that was kicking off lots of radiation because they genuinely got radiation sickness, had health problems for years, tried suing the government, made a legal procedure mistake in, in, in not accepting the offer in a timely manner, and then it got retracted and they never got compensation. Oh. Um, but this is a real event and, and there are others in UFO lore where like people get sunburns and stuff. Wow. 
So uh, I did love the fact that when they, the cop cars are chasing the UFOs, like the UFOs are following the roads. And so mm-hmm. from, for yeah. the most part, until the very end. <laughs> that also happens in UFO literature. There are famous uh, cop car UFO chases that could last half an hour. Like wow. J. Allen Hynek was involved in, 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 in talking about one of those. Oh, okay. And then the, they go off the edge and the cop just falls right off the cliff. That was yeah. <laughs> just so into just chasing this guy. Yeah, that, right, yeah. right. <laughs> He's going there, you know. <laughs> so, um, and then the then there's that scene where the UFOs come back to Jillian, Barry, Barry and Jillian's house and that's when they abduct him. And it's very creepy. It's very, you know, they're coming in through all the different places. And like even that scene where it's coming down the chimney and you could see from the alien's point of view as Jillian's reaching her arm in to close the flu, you know, it's just like, man, it was such a creepy scene. I, I, re- I remember seeing that as a kid. Uh, it becomes like a haunted house movie. For yes. Like an entire sequence. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah, kind of like Poltergeist, kind of. She's trying to keep the child from, from being taken. And and they... Um, go ahead. No, I just... This was a total side thing. Did dishwashers open that way, or was that yes. the aliens? I, okay. There was I don't, models I, I, like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I thought they totally broke it. I'm like, oh, man, they ripped all, the top off. Also, when they do take the boy, they pull him out horizontally through the cat flap. Yep. And yeah. that's similar to the way Fox Mulder's, visually similar to the way Fox Mulder's sister is abducted horizontally through a window. Oh, right, right, right. So... In order to, for the army, in order to get everyone out of the vicinity of Devil's Tower in Wyoming, they have to cl- create this elaborate hoax to, and they, they, they come up with a, uh, an army train carrying toxic weapons, chemical weapons, uh, spilled. This was before chemical weapons were banned and they had to get everybody out of Just there. Just after actually. Oh, yeah. 1975. Mm-hmm. I think that was, it was in the it? Nixon, it was in the Nixon administration. Yeah. Or just after. By the way, just to point out, um, our very own father, Andrew Kinstetter, oh, who's the host of The Secrets of Star Wars on our network, his parents own a ranch next to Devil's Tower. So, oh, uh, oh and they, cool. And they once, trip. they once invited me to, you know, to come visit them sometime if I'm ever, I've said I want to go out to, to uh, Yellowstone with my family. And they're like, oh, stop by the, far, the ranch. I'm like, Devil's Tower is on that itinerary. <laughs> we should probably talk about what Devil's Tower is for people who may not oh, be yeah. familiar with it and why does yeah. it look that way. So what Devil's Tower is, is it's a, it's, it's a volcanic structure. Originally, there was like a big mound of dirt here in Wyoming. And underneath that, there was magma, which forced its way up towards the surface and hardened. And then over time, all the dirt around the formation eroded, leaving just the solidified magma. And so that's why Devil's Tower has this shape. It's kind of conical. It goes up towards a point, but then it levels off at the top. And it's got these columnated uh, striations going down the sides where we're at the edge of the uh, of the lava tube where the magma hardened. It looks kind of like a vertical version of Giant's Causeway yeah. in Ireland, if you've ever seen that. It has the same kind of, it looks like a, a single big column that's made out of a bunch of much smaller columns stuck together in a kind of upside down ice cream cone shape, the <laughs> kind of ice cream cone that has the flat bottom, which is now its top. That's right. That's right. That's a good. That's a good way of describing it. Mike has helpfully made his uh, background in our yeah, video. Yeah. The, the Devil's Tower. I, I know it doesn't help anybody but the four of us. But. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, I love how when they're uh, when they're coming up with this concocted scheme. Yes. And they're going through all the different like things they could use. One of the things they do is like an, an illness, a plague, and the one guy says, "No one's gonna believe a plague in this day and age." And I'm thinking, <laughs> I to, oh, that didn't age well. <laughs> <laughs> I had to laugh at that one. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. So I mentioned so the anthrax, it, and that they said somebody will stay. Somebody will stay. Yeah, yeah. It, was it the closest to the Vietnam War that made the this chemical weapon thing will, will scare everybody? Was that was that part of the reasoning? You think? Well, they certainly well, chemical weapons are certainly scary, and they specifically say nerve gas in the film as their cover story. When, what they actually say they're using, though, it, because they to create the illusion that there's been this chemical spill, they do aerial spraying. I guess at night, so no one would see it, but they do aerial spraying of local farmland with a sleep gas that puts the animals to sleep for an extended period. So you see these 
cows and pigs and goats and sheep and stuff as Roy and Jillian are driving towards Devil T- Devil's Tower they're encountering all of these animals laying flat on the ground that look dead they later and I at first I assumed they were dead some of them even look like they may have been predated a little bit mm-hmm. yeah. um, but they uh, they then later say that that's a sleep gas and they go to use it when Jillian and Roy and one other implantee escape and start climbing up towards devil's tower they uh they they start spraying at them with the sleep gas and it gets one of the guys it it, julian and and roy avoid it but this other guy who was with him he gets and he's only in the film for a few scenes yeah but he he gets put to sleep and they say that you'll sleep for six hours and then wake up with a terrible headache Right. And it's like, okay, thank you, Steven Spielberg. You're not actually killing these people. That's good. <laughs> but you're not trying to kill these people. But sleep gas is extremely dangerous because yes. you cannot control the dosage that someone receives. If they take in a big lungful because they've been running and they're panting heavy, they're going to get more of that into their system. Then there's no way to calibrate how much someone is going to receive. And this was uh, illustrated a few years ago um, after it was, I for, it was in the early 2000s, but uh, some Chechen rebels in, in Russia took over uh, like, um, it was, I don't know, theater? it was not a theater or something yeah. like an opera house or a bit of theater, something like that. And the Russians decided to use sleep gas to end the hostage crisis. And they ended up killing all these people. Because there is no way to control dosing with sleep right. gas. You you can make them go to sleep, but you may kill them in the process. Yes. Unlike Star Trek, where they can release parts per million into an area. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. I thought it was interesting with that because I, I didn't remember that it was sleep gas. So I'm thinking, okay, so the government killed a bunch of animals to freak people out and make them turn around or leave or whatever. Um, but at the same time, they didn't go with, and I liked it, the, the trope of, okay, the military is going to take this over and we're going to, we're, we're afraid of these aliens and we might have to shoot them. The, the whole kind of confrontation thing uh, wasn't there, even though the military was present. And then they took it to the nth degree of, we don't even kill the animal. We just put them to sleep. We're not, right. you know, we're not that mm-hmm. bad. We're so good in what we're trying to do that we get people out take care of them uh how they're going to explain that their animals woke up from nerve gas i don't i don't know how they Mabel, did that, it's a miracle but, <laughs> i know but but well, we're not even killing the animals even the little birdies that we saw fall down we'll just have a headache in six hours and get back up. i love the fact that when roy and jillian are captured by the guys in the suits and the hazmat the ha- suits, hazmat suits and they 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 take them out and you see one guy kind of disappears for a second into the car because Roy and, and Jillian have this basic canaries in a coal mine. They have these little birds in a cage to to sh- tell them if there's gas that will ke- kill them, you know, because they don't really they mostly don't believe that yeah. th- that it's going on. But it's only a hoax. But they, this guy it, disappears for a second and comes out with the cage and the things are are, are apparently over. dead. Yeah. yeah. There, that's so. The principle behind the canary in the coal mine, for people who may not be familiar, is you know, in coal mines, there can you can encounter natural gas, which is odorless to humans. Now, if you have a, like your stove, well, you're going, wait, my the natural gas that comes from my stove or my propane tank, I smell that, yes, because that smell is added. Mm-hmm. naturally natural gas has no smell and so it can build up in a coal mine and so as a safety measure miners figured out we can take little tiny birds that have little tiny lungs and down into uh, the mine with us and the bird is not because it's so small and has a fast metabolism it will die first and so if the bird keels over, that means there's there's natural gas here. I need to get out of here. Mm-hmm. And so they have, as part of this nerve gas cover story, the people in Wyoming are freaking out. And you, there's this one guy who's selling animals to use as, as nerve gas detectors. Right. And then later they use it. And the, Jillian and Roy get one, get a pair of them. They've got it in a cage in a car. They they seem fine, but they're still so nervous they put their gas masks on anyway. Yeah. When they see the dead animals, I yeah. think yeah. part of it. Yeah. And if you listen closely, at that point where the guy ducks into the car to get the cage, you hear what sounds like a spray, like so a spray bottle. 
Like he sprayed uh, them with something to knock them out. You like got to listen Batman. for him. <laughs> right, all that, right. All that pink sleep gas you'd see sprayed in Batman's face on Batman. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, the, these elaborate lengths of the hoax. And then they're captured in Neary. We see this interview of Neary and Lacombe. And Lacombe is trying to keep the hoax going. And Neary just insists. And finally, Lacombe says, what did you expect to find here? You've 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 risked your life against nerve gas. You've like this against everything that is reasonable. What did you expect to find here? And Roy just an answer. Like why? What is this ruining my life? Why is this thing come into my life to ruin it? I need an answer. Uh, I really love that moment in the movie. Uh, so L Lacombe wants the army to let these people go. Because he, he basically says they were invited. And yeah. he, he imagines he says, that he says they belong here more than we. Right. He imagines that the, the aliens have implanted probably thousands of people and only so many of them ha have you know made the connection with Wyoming and Devil's Tower. And then even fewer will try to go and even fewer will make it this far. And, and it comes down to just two of them getting over the mountain and one getting to the ship. And, uh, and so it's really kind of fascinating to see how Lacombe sees this reality. And eventually mm -hmm. that's why he sends Roy on the, on board the ship. So um, we get this, this scene of them on the other side of the mountain. They have uh, the concert at Red Rocks, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> a little John Tesh going on. They're playing the music, then the tones, and you have these small UFOs responding to the musical notes and the, and it all ends. And like you said, Jimmy, they fly away. And you think, that's it. We're done. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Yeah. And and the ships we see in this scene, there's like three of them plus the little yellow, the little red follow ball, mm -hmm. uh, which I mentioned earlier. I just love how that thing always shows up last. It's bringing up the rear. <laughs> um, but we've seen these before, and they're relatively small, and they're not saucers. None of the ships in this are classic saucers, although right. the mothership we're going to see is is sort kind of. of like a saucer, but it's been augmented with other stuff. Yeah. Um, but we've seen these relatively small UFOs before, and they were like whipping over highways at the UFO campouts, and they were low enough over the highways. That's why the cop car followed him off the cliff, because it looked like it was driving on the road in front of him. Right. And um, and so th the familiar UFOs that we've seen, they show up, they do a little musical number with the humans communicating with them, and then they leave. And and we and so all the humans are thinking this is done. We can go home now. Um, and it turns out, no, that was just the hello party. <laughs> and and now that they've we've checked out with them, they're going to bring in the real people that want to talk to us. And they do the same thing in this that they that Spielberg does in Jaws, which with the music is every time we saw the aliens before, we would see hear music, musical tones. Here, there's no music as the mothership arrives, and it's it it just comes out of the clouds and uh, very very sinister clouds. In fact, yeah, the the clouds and I it start encircling Devil's Tower in this ominous fashion, and there's this rumbling and flashes of light in the clouds, and there's a great bit of direction on Spielberg's part where um, Julian. Uh, uh, sorry, Jillian, who is hiding up in this kind of crevasse. Roy, Roy has already gone down yep. to to the flat top where they, they've been meeting the aliens um, or where they've been talking to the aliens. Jillian didn't have the courage to do that. Since Barry wasn't here, she didn't go down at first. And, she, and so as the clouds are ominously circling Devil's Tower, she turns around and we get this reverse angle shot of her staring up into the sky seeing something impressive coming right and and yeah. it's a very effective visual moment and and if you pretend you've never seen this movie before you're thinking did we just blow that first contact <laughs> right is is right. is because now this is turning spooky and then the mothership shows up and it turns out that it's okay after all that was the welcome party now this the the didn't a bunch of other ships precede the mothership uh, a lot of other mm -hmm. They yeah. came with different it. bigger yeah. kind of things yeah. came with it and then they all kind of made room for right the mothership yeah, yeah. okay if and, and there was one point too uh the devil's mount what is tower it tower there? tower excuse me devil's tower uh is 
got a little black spec green screen where they're putting their landing area in there. And it really fit in well, except one time when the mothership really lit up Devil's Tower. Mm -hmm. You could clearly see that that landing strip wasn't really there because it wasn't being lit correctly. And it yeah, right. Because the landing strip is really in Alabama. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's where they filmed that sequence. Okay. And, and, and I also want to point out that as I'm watching this, I'm like, despite a lot of things, they're not guarding this very well. I mean, I guess they're really hoping everyone is gone. Uh, because of the evacuation, but it's it seems you know to a certain extent not that difficult to to infiltrate this landing strip. You know, I mean, <laughs> if, if if people are around, there's nobody guarding it. They're kind of like we're safe now, and and uh, you know, Roy and Jillian, you know, you got to see this from pretty a, easily, yeah. and you got to see this light show from a long distance. That's for sure. I, I like when it looks like the one fella is going to try and stop Roy, but he's just running for the porta potty. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention that. It's awesome. He's yeah. so freaked out. Got to get to that porta potty. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So we have this scene of the the music, the music back and forth, and then uh, the guys trying to play the uh, the organ with. A, you know, in, in response, you know, it starts slow and speeds up and gets too fast. They, they have the computers take over, which is great. 1977 computers, like that whole thing. We're syncing up and, you know, they go. It's like a player piano effect now with the computers yes. in control. That's right. Someone pointed out to Spielberg long after he did this, that his father was a computer programmer and his mother a musician. Mm. <laughs> and, and didn't think of it at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, he didn't think of it at the time, but he goes, look, did that influence how you did that? Like, <laughs> I don't know. And, and then, of course, there's a, a relatively famous moment in the concert where, you know, we're 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 trying variations on the theme, you know, the five tones. And so mm -hmm. we're varying it. We're mixing it up. At one point, they try just the first three tones in a kind of, you know, it's kind of like shave and a haircut. And you can expect the other person to go two bits. Yeah. Well, they do. Da, 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 and wait for the aliens to finish. And the aliens go, bah, bah, <laughs> with so much force that it shatters the windows of the observation booths they've got set up. That's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Which is in character for these aliens of not really knowing how to be gentle with us, <laughs> yeah. and how to, you know, treat us well. The, the one thing that I really enjoyed, and you can go try this. I, I was watching it for some reason. I was having trouble hearing the voices. I don't know if it was my stereo, but I, I turned on the subtitles and when you got the subtitles, it gives you like, you know, uh, this is Roy and Roy speaking. And it says, you know, who, what he's saying. And uh, there is the point where the spaceship decides to communicate with the Jaws music uh, yeah. briefly. Yes. And the subtitles have spaceship. And it says plays music theme from Jaws. I saw that too. <laughs> awesome. I, saw that I was too. like, was whoa. Great. <laughs> and it's a that, little that the... it's a little scary because <laughs> have they been talking to the sharks first? <laughs> we could be in real trouble if sharks have been the ambassadors from Earth. We could all get <laughs> eaten. That's right. Shark, shark, NATO. <laughs> shark week. Uh, yeah, I, d I had that in my notes too. Like this, the, the big ship makes sounds like Jaws theme. <laughs> so, and then we have the you know the ship you know lands quote unquote it was a landing uh you know a, a ramp ramp i guess yes and we have abductees coming out and they're from all kinds of ears if you look close you can see people who are obviously wearing stuff from the late 19th century i don't know if we saw anything mm -hmm. earlier than that um we had the flight 19 crew uh mm -hmm. which i i was kind of taken aback because one of the guys said captain u.s navy they they got that wrong a little bit it's actually there was a captain u.s U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, I was kind mm. of, a, he looked young and well, I didn't Marine, think a captain would the, be flying a plane. The Marine Corps is part of the Navy. Well, Naval Service, but uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a Marine would never say Captain U.S. Navy. <laughs> never, yeah. ever, yeah. ever, ever. <laughs> so um, we also, we uh, also, the aliens apparently abducted Steven Spielberg's dog Elmer because he comes down the ramp too. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. well, and that's another dog. connection to them talking to sharks because he was Roy Schneider's dog. And Jaws. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, it all yeah. connects. <laughs> it all connects. <laughs> it all um, yeah. And then uh, they, you know, they're crossing people off as they they obviously are prepared to receive these abductees because they're crossing uh you know names and uh you know pictures off as they people arrive, uh, which is fascinating. I uh, can't imagine what it would be like for these people to return. Uh that this that would be a fascinating sequel. 
And they note they haven't aged in the time they were gone. So maybe they've been in cryo or something. That's right. what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, just like the, the Flight 19 planes hadn't aged a, a day. Like there was some, you know, I don't know, Einsteinian effect or time dilation effect or something. But yeah, know. they said there was some sort of like relativism because they mentioned Einstein yeah. was right. And he goes, Einstein was one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah yes. as a joke they say yeah. that yeah yeah of as course a joke. Joke. yeah or was it or was it uh, <laughs> uh, uh there is an interesting scene as they're preparing this this group of astronauts let's just call them astronauts cultural exchange students uh yeah. as they're preparing them to go they're in a prayer service led by a chaplain i i either a catholic priest or a mm -hmm. anglican minister or something but he looked he was investments in the whole thing I think we're meant to understand he's Catholic. Um, and also, like in a military chapel, this is an ecumenical interreligious chapel because they have yeah. not only a cross and a holy water bucket in the background, but also a Star of David. And that's that's typical for military chapels. They will be interfaith. And yeah. then, you you know, you like turn the cross around or whatever. Now it's crucifix. You do Catholic mass. You turn it back around. You bring your Baptists in and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> right, right. Uh, in his uh, prayer, he he re references him going on a pilgrimage, which I think is an interesting idea, a way of framing this f this thing that they're embarking on. Uh, the I, I really appreciated this scene because you this is very realistic. If yeah. if we had people that were about to go on an exchange program to outer space under these circumstances, knowing as little as about all this, yeah, they would want a prayer service first. They would want to go to confession first. They would want to have yep. the Eucharist first. They would want to do all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's it really does speak to the time, the 1970s of, you know, this was much more of the time in a movie. Yeah, you'd see this in a movie. You'd see it a lot. Of, you'd see a lot of religious stuff in movies in the 70s. Um, yep. In fact, it, um, oh, is it Kaufman who directed the 1978 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Um, but he put Richard Dreyfuss, what was it Richard? No, it was Robert De Niro as a, as a priest in just in, just in the background swinging on a swing in the Invasion of the Body Snatchers 1978 version because there were so many priests in movies at the time. It was kind of a trope. Oh, um, right. And this that's a year after this. Um, but uh, but even today, it would be realistic to have this kind of service for personnel before they go off on a dangerous mission like this. And I don't think uh, Neary was in the prayer service. He was no. still getting prepped. Yeah. And it's interesting. I guess in one way you could say the prayer worked because none of them got taken. I think it depends on which version you watch. I think yeah, one right. of the three versions has the others going too. Oh, they do. Okay. Well, yeah, the, I, I watched the theatrical. Okay. Yeah. Maybe not then. I always understood that we see him go aboard, like they come to him, but I, my, I always, you know, assumed that they were just bringing up the rear, like they were going too. That, uh, yeah, it looked to me like they took, they picked him out and kind of bypassed everybody, and they're all like, yeah, you know, no. surrounding him like children and touching him, and he goes up, and I don't remember seeing any other red suits walk up the ramp. There, there I weren't, there weren't any in the in the director's cut. My memory from 1977 was I thought all of them went, mm -hmm. um, but then in, but then in the special edition in 1980, it's only Roy who goes up. And then in the director's cut that I watched from like 1998, um, it is also only Roy that goes up. So maybe those other people didn't get to go. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then as Neary, as we mentioned it before, as Neary says goodbye, we hear When You Wish Upon a Star, uh, the, the the song, which is, you know, apropos. And we have this, and the music yeah, rises. Yeah, b before the aliens bring in the sharks and they eat Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Come aboard. We're, ha we're having dinner. <laughs> to serve To serve man. To serve man. <laughs> it's a cock book. Uh, so they, as, as the movie ends, we have this, the, 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 uh, the uprising music. It's a very optimistic theme. And, and we're kind of left with this life out there is friendly and wants to be understood. And, and I know Jimmy, you pointed out how this, this alien life is scary and incomprehensible. This but alien this really, life is insane. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, but really I think Spielberg is, is advancing this idea because so many science fiction movies of the era of the, yeah. uh, you know, earlier were life out there will be scary and it's a menace. And even afterward, a lot of the movies were the same way, but Spielberg in this and in E.T., you know, really advance this idea of maybe life out there is friendly. Maybe life out there is just something we need to get to know. 
And there had been other movies like that as far back as the 1950s, including The Day the Earth Stood Still and Plan 9 from Outer Space. Right, right, right. That's true. And Star Trek, you know, and, and uh, you know, TV, sci-fi and that sort of thing as well. So, um, yeah. That, so anything else we didn't cover in this? Uh, Thomas, did you have any other notes on this on this movie? No, I, I, I think we covered it pretty thoroughly. OK. How about you, Mike? Anything left to say about this? I, I didn't get the sense that his wife left him as much as she's like, I need to take the kids somewhere else. I'm taking them to my sisters. This isn't good right now. And and then him, you know, kissing Jillian. That was weird. Which I thought was, yeah. you know, yeah, just out of place. You know, I mean, I know they had a connection, but it didn't have to go there. And then just leaving like, well, by, uh, he has children. I mean, not just mm-hmm. the wife, but children. So uh, and I, re- I did read that Spielberg would have not done that. You know, like if he had to had to do it over again, he either would have explained it better or not have him leave his family to go to our space. So, so that, that that wasn't. Yeah. It didn't hit me good. I And that's something that I was thinking about as well. Now, there is a scene after he goes crazy and is throwing all the stuff through the kitchen window. She takes the kids and she is so mad at him and scared of him at this point that when he tries to climb on the car, mm-hmm. she just drives off anyway and he's yeah. like thrown off onto the ground. And so she's she's physically assaulted him with she's she's just committed vehicular assault right. on her husband. And and I think that's something that Spielberg meant to indicate just how serious this is from her perspective and how much damage has been done to their relationship. But then later, after he builds the giant devil's tower sculpture in their living room, which like goes up to the ceiling, um, he she calls him on the phone and she we don't hear her side of the conversation, but she's giving him extremely bad news and it's extremely upsetting to Roy. And it's like, we have to talk. We, we have to meet. We can't talk about this on the phone. And I interpret that as she's telling him she wants a divorce yeah. and she's and she's taking the children. Um, and that's what then that Spielberg's way of freeing him up to have the romantic side plot with Jillian in the third act of the film. It's because she, Terry Gar is definitively broken with him and is taking the kids, so he doesn't have kids anymore, effectively. And um, and so you have this juxtaposition or counterpoise between Jillian, who gets her child back and stays, whereas Roy uh, has lost his children and goes to space. You know, right. she, she initially lost her child, got it back. Roy mm-hmm. lost his kids, and so he leaves. And now has several dozen little alien children <laughs> to follow him around. <laughs> I remember back in the day, I read the novelization of this, which Spielberg co-wrote. And um, I remember reading, like, one of the aspects of the film is it takes place over an extended period. This isn't oh. just a few days. Yeah, that, that's something I wanted to comment on because... As you watch the film, it becomes clear that this is happening over a long period of time. But Spielberg has not effectively communicated that early on. Right. Almost immediately after he's had his first encounter in his truck, and then he comes home and he's all amped up and he takes his wife and the kids out on one of the UFO campouts, you know, to look for him. Uh, they get back and like the next scene, his wife tells him his boss has called and fired him. And I'm going, right. what? Why did why did he get fired? He didn't do anything wrong. You know, he, he didn't make it to the electrical site he was supposed to go to, but it wasn't it wouldn't have done any good anyway. The lights came back on as soon as the as soon as the UFO left. So why would he get in trouble for that? And he, he, there even was a uh, opening thing where it said present day. Yeah. In yeah. The beginning yeah, that of the confused film. me. But I, I never like, followed what? that up with like he could have kept on saying you know, days later, all yeah, the yeah. other indicators uh, with with text and the screen of when, where are we? Yeah. yeah. So I, I thought that was ineffective storytelling on Spielberg's part. That's a flaw in the movie that if he wants to advance from time to time like that, he needs to give the audience early on more of a signal because I was halfway through the movie and I'm thinking this has taken place in two or three days. 
The only indication I found of the passage of time was that Roy's face, the burn on his face healed between yeah. between scenes. You know, like, oh, something, the time must have passed. Yeah, there's that, although that could be explained by makeup error. Um, sure. But also, like, as he gets more obsessed, and by the way, we, we need to mention the mashed potato scene. <laughs> yes. Because oh, at, yes. at, at one point as part, by the way, so early on at, at like the, at his at one of his UFO campouts, he meets Jillian and Barry and Barry is making a kind of mud mound that looks kind of like Devil's Tower, but it's got this rounded top on it. Mm -hmm. And he's and Roy says, oh, I, the last couple of days I've been seeing that shape everywhere in, in pillows and other things. And it's like, yes, that's called the batter Meinhof phenomenon. It's common. You you get something stuck in your mind and then you see it everywhere. Right. And it doesn't mean you're under you're under telepathic domination by aliens normally. But in this case, apparently it does. Um, and he then keeps tr sketching and trying to recreate this shape. And it's always wrong. He's always unhappy with it. Famously, there's this scene at the dinner table where they're serving mashed potatoes in an enormous bowl of mashed potatoes for that number of people. Yeah. And it compared to all the other items in the, uh, like the vegetables and the meat. And then there's like a Thanksgiving size tub of mashed potatoes. Uh, that's yeah. how much we serve at my <laughs> table, so, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Roy starts scooping enormous amounts of mashed potatoes onto his plate and playing it with his fork, trying to put the striations on it. And that was the first time he got the striations right, because he had a yeah. fork. Yeah. And he started doing that. And and this was a famous, this is one of the most famous scenes in the movie. It was later parodied on Saturday Night Live and stuff like that. Um, and then eventually he's He's doing another sculpture that's out of clay, but he's got the rounded top on it. And eventually he, he, he things have become so tense. And there's actually in the mashed potato scene, he's clearly freaking out. He's so obsessed with the mashed potatoes. His family, I should say, is freaking out. And his yeah. son, his oldest son, who's sitting next to him starts crying just silently tears start rolling down his cheek because he sees his father disintegrating mentally yeah. next to him and Roy is saying like don't worry I know dad's been kind of strange but I'm still dad and his son is just you know crying and later he there's a fight between him and Terry Gar and the son is crying again and it's really um it's very effective uh yeah. affective it's very moving um but then Roy's making the clay model and and he gets basically an ultimatum. He realizes he's 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 gone crazy and he starts he swears off all this UFO stuff. He starts tearing down this extensive collection of clippings that he's posted to the wall. And we never saw him post those clippings. So that to me, that was a clue. Oh, this is substantially later. Yeah, because it would have taken time for all of these clippings to get published and for him to read them and collect them and put them up on the wall. So to me, that was what signaled a lot of time passing. And then it's in that scene as he's tearing down his clippings and throwing away all his UFO stuff. He goes to the clay mount clay model he's made and is tugging on the top of it to try to push the whole thing into the trash can. And instead, the top comes off. And that's when it most resembles Devil's Tower. And th then it, it he falls right back down into the black hole again mm. and becomes re-obsessed. And that's when he goes crazy and starts working on the giant version in their living room. Yeah, claiming that he feels good now. Yeah. He just yeah. needs to put all this dirt in there. When the, during the dinner scene, the tension was broken by an, uh, an ad, I guess you could call it an ad lib, but the girl just said yeah. there's a fly in my mashed potatoes, which wasn't in the <laughs> script and broke some of the actors, you know, into laughing but they kept it in because it was just so <laughs> yeah. funny and everything but that wasn't scripted. There, there are a lot of nice little touches. Like you, we mentioned the porta potty guy who's so freaked mm -hmm. out by, he's got to go to the porta potty. Another is when Roy is going crazy and ripping up his neighbor's, uh, his neighbor's chicken wire. She like holds a hair dryer on him, like a <laughs> yeah. gun from the window because she doesn't know what else to do. <laughs> He's like the uh, Kravitz lady next yeah. door. And he's yeah. always watching. Yeah. Oh, and I, I like when, when he, he goes to steal the garbage can. He doesn't even let the garbage guy throw the garbage in the truck. He just <laughs> pours it onto the street and walks off with it. And the guy well, looks at him like, the garbage, yeah. and the guy looks at him like, really? 
Really? <laughs> and later, when the garbage truck has gone off, you see the garbage man did what he should and left the garbage, garbage. right there in the yeah. street for it. Like you poured it out, you pick it up. Yeah. It's not my job to pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, there's so much of this movie has entered into the, the cultural, uh, lingua franca franca i mean just it's just part of our culture now things like when when there's something really spooky or creepy you know people will do the five tones do 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 like ooh, it's scoopy it's a uh, spooky you know that sort of thing i mean you know and everybody of a certain age anyway who knows devil's tower now i mean it's before this movie it was a uh, you know uh, something in the that people drove by on vacations to yellowstone Maybe. you know Maybe. Right. But now it's 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 I mean, if you go, I am sure that if you go to Devil's Tower, even today, you know, 40 years later, there's still UFO you know, gift shops around the base of it somewhere. Uh, so it's uh, it's kind of fascinating how much this movie penetrated the American consciousness and really became an enduring part of, you know, our, our culture. Yeah. Including UFO culture. Uh, so this is kind of the last thing I had to say about the movie. But um, this movie has a prominent place in contemporary UFO lore because, of course, someone got to Spielberg. <laughs> right. And and so Aww. and and there are things that um, are reported about this, like for so on the one hand. There are uh, authors and speakers in the UFO community who will say that Spielberg was tipped off by the government and they wanted him to make this movie as part of a gradual disclosure program to encourage people to get used to the idea of aliens because the government knows they're real and has contact with them and they're gradually warming up the public to the idea of disclosure in stages so that people don't freak out. And this was this movie, according to this view, is one of the early stages of disclosure where it's like we prevent this meeting in this fictional format and it'll help encourage people to mentally adjust to the idea of this happening in real life. Um, then there's the flip side, which is the government tried to suppress this film. Um, and as evidence for that, uh, they will cite the fact, which has been confirmed by Steven Spielberg, that um, now apparently the Air Force didn't want to participate in this movie and neither did NASA. And according to Spielberg, NASA sent him a 20 page letter explaining why he should not make this movie. And um, and that was actually something he took as a good sign that this was hitting a cultural nerve if he they wrote him a 20 page letter. Um, basically, the reason they didn't want him to um, or in essence, the reason they didn't want him to make this movie isn't because it would um, upset disclosure plans or anything like that, or at least that's not what they said. But um, basically, he had just made Jaws and freaked out everybody about <laughs> going to the beach. Right. And he, they didn't want him doing the same thing for aliens and causing an alien panic like there had been a shark panic. And then you'd have all these people terrified of aliens and seeing them and reporting them, and it would be a huge mess. And so that's that's why they uh, that's why they didn't want Spielberg to make this movie. Um, but that didn't stop rumors that either he was it was part of a disclosure program or maybe the government's right hand didn't know what its left hand was doing and NASA was trying to stop it. And then there is the final sequence in the movie, the meeting, the actual meeting with the exchange program. Now, mm -hmm. there have been reports in the UFO literature of meetings like this. Um, going back to uh, at least there, there were reportedly, this is according to some UFO authors, Eisenhower had a meeting like this at Holloman Air Force Base where Ike and the pres and the aliens got together and they did some kind of exchange thing. But in 2005, there was a series of alleged UFO leaks about something known as Project Serpo. And Project Serpo was this. Um, according to the according to the leaks, um, in 1965, 
there was a meeting like this where we had a bunch of our personnel, not as many as we see in the film, but we had, I think it was like nine or something, nine uh, U.S. service people, mostly men, but there were a couple of women who were sent to this other planet called Serpo. The aliens took them on board the ship. They took them to their planet as an exchange program. And... um, and then weird stuff happened. Uh, some of them didn't want to come back. Others died. Um, and all of them had radiation poisoning eventually, and they died prematurely anyway. Um, and this all started to come out in 2005. And so you will have people in the UFO community saying that's what Spielberg was tipped off with. He was given early knowledge of Project Serpo. And um, and and so that explains the final sequence in the film. Of course, correlation does not mean causation. It can go the other way around. Steven Spielberg's film Close Encounters with its exchange program looks like that's actually what inspired the 2005 Project Serpo reports, which appear to have been written by our old friend counterintelligence agency or contributed to by our old friend counterintelligence agency and known liar Richard Doty. Oh, oh no. Richard Doty. <laughs> oh, and man. so uh, so these days and. If you want to know about Richard Doty, uh, you can go back and listen to uh, episodes 143 and 144 of Mysterious World, where we talk about Paul Benowitz and Richard Doty. But these days, uh, Project Serpo is widely regarded, even in the UFO community, as a hoax, although, in fact, a disinformation hoax. Although um, you will still find people who say that's what Steven Spielberg got covert information on and he based this sequence on it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's the, the amazing thing is, is like the, it, it's curious to me, like that Close Encounters and Star Wars came out at the same time. And I wonder if Star Wars counterbalanced some of what could have been like the shark craze of Jaws, the alien craze of Close Encounters. I, I wonder if it kind of watered it down a bit because it, Star Wars clearly a high fantasy, uh, you know, science mm-hmm. fantasy type of th- project that really gets us looking out, out into space, but kind of mediates a little bit of the presentness of you of close encounters. Also star Wars was vastly more popular than close encounters. I mean, they were both popular, but star Wars yeah. was much more popular. That's why Disney has a star Wars franchise and not a close <laughs> encounters franchise. Yeah. Um, so that would also dilute it. And also the fact that Spielberg, even though he wrote genuinely scary aliens in this, he wasn't ultimately trying to scare us. He's right. he, 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 he wants us to view the end of this movie as hopeful when in reality it would be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably why he wrote E.T. and made that, yeah. you know, five years later, because that's a truly... Friendly, heartwarming. Yeah. heartwarming alien. I mean, he's the original Grogu in, in one sense. I mean, yeah. uh, E.T. in 1982 really hit the culture like Grogu did in 2021 or 20. So, Although uh, I was terrified of E.T. as a kid. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> like when he, he, with the scene where he does the extending neck thing, yes, like, yes, yeah. I, think is... I ran out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> he is not as cute as Grogu, that is for certain. All right. I think that should do it for us this time. Uh, That was a great discussion, guys. I really appreciate you all joining me for this. Uh, We do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create secrets of movies and TV shows, including Clint C., John R., Mike M., Brett, and John M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of movies and TV shows and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So we would love to hear what you think of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash secrets or at the StarQuest Facebook page or send an email to secrets at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for sharing with me the secrets of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and Mike Denz, uh, thank you as well. I won't uh, do that to you with uh, my <laughs> voice, but I, I, my pleasure to be here. And Thomas Salerno, thank you too. Thanks so much, Dom. It's been out of this world. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of movies and TV shows on StarQuest. And remember... 